Hello and welcome to the 18th edition of the India Business Leader Awards. I'm Shireen Bhan. We are here today to recognize and honor the achievers of India Inc. Men and women who have managed global volatility, domestic challenges to emerge as high performers, high achievers. You will have to wait till we reveal those names, but today was the day that the India Business Leader Awards jury deliberated on who will walk away with the honors. But today is also the day where we have seen the RBI, the MPC, deliver its credit policy. We had the budget being announced as well. So two big economic events are off the calendar. And this is, of course, the start of 2023. So to get a sense of what the road from resilience to resurgence will look like, what need to be the actionables uh, on the road ahead, joining me now is the jury of the India Business Leader Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, many, many thanks for joining us here today. Uday Kotak, to you first, sir. Let me start by asking you about what you made of the commentary that came in from the Reserve Bank Governor do you expect a pause or do you expect the tightening to continue? Uh, Shireen, I think the policy was on expected lines, but probably the feeling was that it was a little more hawkish than what the market would have expected. And it follows the Fed Chair's interview last night, which again was perceived a little more hawkish than what the market expected. And you saw the US 10-year rates go back to 364, uh, and uh, here as well, I think withdrawal of accommodation continues. There was some expectation in some market participants that we would move to neutral. And also the inflation projections for FY24, last quarter of March 2024, is still predicting uh, an estimate of inflation at 5.6% for that last quarter. The 65 is roughly about 90 basis points higher than the expectation one year later. Therefore, my personal view is it remains six and a half for a while. I don't think we see reduction in interest rates, and then further tightening, though. I think uh, you have to. I think you have to follow what the RBI says. At the next meeting, they will say they are data dependent. <laughs> Well, let, let's get a quick dipstick survey here. We've got the top bankers of the country here with us, Mr. Kara. What do you make of it? Do you also think that it was more hawkish than what was estimated? I do tend to agree with Dude, but uh, at the same time, I think we are all expected that 25 basis point increase will be there. It was already factored by the market. Uh, I would say that the kind of enablers which they have put in now in terms of you know, uh, when it comes to uses of UPI, even the international players who are coming, mm. international tourist traffic, they can also use UPI when they are coming into the country. Apart from that, security is borrowing and lending, more so for the mutual funds and the insurance company, will make this particular market more deeper, which was the need of the hour. And I would say that, uh, yes, uh, as far as the penal interests are concerned, there will be more order in the industry. So I think these are some of the some of the positives, which probably will uh, lead the industry and the economy to the much mature stage. Okay, so we'll come to the positives in just a second. But Zareen, uh, uh, what do you make of it? A pause from here on, or do you believe that the tightening is likely to continue? I I would agree with Uday. I think uh, the tone was much more uh, hawkish than what the market expected, and I think uh, some statements that suggest that. They're still worried about core inflation. And I think the non-farm payroll data also of U.S., that has also surprised a lot of people. And with dollar strengthening, and to defend the rupee also, I think the interest rate hike is something that could be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could be possible. Which camp do you belong to, Vedinathan? <laughs> well, three of them have spoken, so I don't want to add much to it. But I can just say that uh, the uh, fundamental drivers that is driving the economy in terms of being underserved and, uh, you know, uh, the digitization, uh, massive movement on that, all that will keep moving the economy. And frankly, whether interest rate is this or 20 bps below or above, as long as the economy is continuing to climb at 7% per year or, or real, real rates, I think we're all good. Are we all as good, Sanjeev Mehta, as uh, we hope that we're going to be, especially in terms of consumption, as rates continue to move higher? The RBI governor did allude to the fact that core inflation continues to be very sticky. Uh, you know, what's the impact likely to be on consumption and what do you sense from here on? You know, the rate of inflation will go down. But if we really have to give a fillip to consumption as in volume growth, 
then we have to see commodity prices go down substantially, which would then result in corporations like ours passing the benefit to the consumers. Then the consumption would come back. And you're not at that oh, point? We aren't at that stage. Save and accept a commodity or two like the palm oil, where the prices have gone down and the companies have passed on the benefit to the consumers. In rest of it, they are significantly ahead of, say, the 10-year median. Or if you compare to, say, 2020, many of the prices are at double the rate of what this was two years back. Mm. So you, while you might not be able to do price cuts, do you need to hike prices any further at this point in time? The rate of price hike would be substantially lower. But what you would see in the price growth would first be coming in from the price increases that were taken in the second half of the last year. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about consumption and we're talking about prices, TV Narendran, let me ask you, uh, you know, the big X factor in all of this is, of course, what China does and what that is going to mean as far as commodity prices are concerned. We've started to see some visible impact of that. What's the expectation? I think uh, that's the elephant in the room. China is expected to come back more strongly than most people thought. Let's wait and see over the next few weeks because there's a lot of pent-up consumption in China. Just like we saw in India because of COVID restrictions, a lot of consumption didn't happen. If you see what's happening in China over the last few weeks, travel is uh, you know, really moving, not just for Lunar New Year. There are a lot of people coming into China, traveling out of China. So there are a lot of uh, parts of the Chinese economy which are expected to rebound because of uh, the COVID restrictions being removed. Secondly, I think they have done a good job of fixing most of the property issues that they dealt with, that they had. And so if China comes back strongly, if you really look at what triggered inflation a few years back, mm. it was a post-COVID recovery and supply chains couldn't keep up. I think supply chains have got fixed a lot, but the recovery in China could be uh, something which drives inflation back again. Well, you know, how much is it likely to drive prices higher? That's good news for you, so you will have a bigger smile on your well, face. But, uh, but how much is it likely to move prices higher by? What's no, the expectation? So, Shireen, it's yes and no for us because uh, we are also a buyer of commodities like coal. Uh, so we are watchful. We are also watching energy prices, gas prices, all that impacts our cost. Uh, but uh, if you look at the commodity I represent steel, prices have gone up over 10, 15 percent in the last yeah. Well, Anish, consumption, uh, this was the big sort of budget that tried to do its part as far as CapEx was concerned, credit and consumption. Uh, you know, at this point in time, what's the outlook really as far as consumption is concerned? We are seeing very strong consumption across all our sectors. In auto, it's driven by products that we have. Surprisingly, the farm sector has held up very well. And the growth in farm equipment and tractors in particular has been far higher than what we've expected this mm. year. Uh, and that augurs well for India overall. And as we see across other sectors in hospitality and logistics and real estate, we're continuing to see very high demand. Uh, and uh, that that's really hadn't hasn't calmed down. So, yet. you know, this is what I want to link. Uh, uh, Sanjeev Mehta, I want you to come in on this. Here's Anisha saying that actually rural demand as far as their tractor segment is concerned has been very, very strong. But that hasn't been the case as far as FMCG is concerned. How do the two then reconcile? Yeah, there is a fundamental difference. Tractors are not owned by farm hands. Farm hands consumption is driven by wages. Yeah, and uh, it is not that the growth is not there. If you look at the full year 22, we are still talking about the top line or the headline growth still being positive even in rural India. But for the kind of price increase we have seen, which has been unprecedented, it's also not surprising that the consumers have titrated the volume. Mm. Uh, Prabha, and I want to come to you on that. You know, what are the trends that you're seeing? Because there was a lot of expectation on what it would mean in terms of down trading and so on and so forth. Many companies have, in fact, innovated as far as pack sizes are concerned just to be able to beat inflation. Uh, what are you seeing at this point in time and how are you mitigating some of these risks? So what we're seeing actually is very similar to what Mr. Mehta said in terms of the rural consumption not coming back as fast and certainly amongst the rural poor we are seeing consumption being under serious pressure, particularly in categories that are not seen as fully essential and a choice can be made. What we are seeing at the other end of the spectrum is premium urban consumers are actually driving market demand and premiumization continues to grow apace. So it's kind of like a two-phased market. And in terms of pack sizes and down trading, we're not seeing any significant shift as yet, more just a curtailment of consumption where money is tight and wages are not coming back to meet the inflation 
the inflation that's happening in the in their baskets but it will come and there is we are seeing a little bit of green shoot so hopefully it will come as we go on and obviously there is always more opportunity at the premiumization end of the spectrum as far as india is concerned absolutely mr kotak i want to address uh, one of the challenges that we could potentially face and link that to what is happening globally and you did allude uh, to that in your tweet while i think there is consensus that at this point in time the risks uh, domestically are few and far between the risks globally are the ones that we need to brace ourselves for. You talked about the foreign debt aspect and how that makes some companies perhaps more vulnerable. And that's what I wanted to understand. If the Indian banking system doesn't have a systemic risk at this point in time, what are some of the global challenges that you are worried about? See, I think, uh, and I see a lot of corporates here, uh, they should be borrowing more from Indian financial institutions. <laughs> They're borrowing too much from outside. I'm, I'm sure my banking colleagues will agree with us. Mr. Khara, you want to, you want to come in on that as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think market uh, is probably guiding them to borrow more from the Indian market. No. <laughs> Global market And, and I, I, I believe that, uh, and I'm not going into any specifics, I think this is a time for Indian financial sector to build its capacity both in terms of underwriting skills as well as scale. And I do not believe global financials necessarily have better underwriting skills, but India has to hone it and its own financial sector should be able to do thorough diligence and get its underwriting right. If we do that, and we need to build a whole host of capacities in India so that corporates feel that the first port of call is to borrow from mm. India. And the risks of global borrowing is that a person sitting in New York, London, Zurich, Hong Kong, Beijing, wherever, may not understand the Indian dynamics as well and is very much focused and impacted by media reports globally. Mm. And decisions can be taken more superficially without going necessarily into the facts of the case. Mm. Uh, you know, just wanted to take that point forward. Uh, you said that decisions can be taken based on headlines, so to speak, and a superficial assessment of those headlines as opposed to a deeper understanding of the dynamics. What's the risk of that at this point in time? Do you believe that there is an outflow risk or an India premium being cut risk at this point? See, I've had chats with many investors. And, you know, investors are like different animals in a jungle. Each have a different strategy. So there are a set of investors which are saying, top-down India getting carried away by the headlines. But there are many bottom-up and smart investors who are asking the question, which is deeper, that how are Indian company valuations? And will this give us an opportunity to invest? And of course, the most common comparison is, oh, China is much cheaper than India. Hmm. And therefore, they're looking at relative valuations, but they are looking for value. Therefore, investors play different games and different investors are different. You cannot have one size yep. colors all and for every seller there could be another global investor who says it's a great buy time. Rajiv Mamani, let me get you in uh, on this aspect as well, on how global investors are viewing the India story at this point in time and what you believe uh, will be the India advantage that can be leveraged. Yeah, I would say by and large when people come uh, from different parts of the world and they come to India, the general optimism in India is right now probably very high. I think the budget delivered a very good message in terms of government's focus on macroeconomics. I, the the, the uh, investments in infrastructure and the multiplier impact of that, fiscal deficit, so on and so forth. So I would say by and large they are very excited about India. Uh, they want to invest more. Uh, and I'm talking more about not so much people who are investing in the markets, but much more about private equity, venture yeah. capital, foreign direct investment, strategic investors. So they are, I, I think, and some of the things that have happened, some very bold decisions over the last four, four, maybe last year, year and a half, including the one on Vodafone right now. I, I think that's also opening up the minds of people to say, yes, if the government really wants, they can move, they, they can move things. So overall, very positive. Uh, and Shireen, the, the, the main thing is for, from a manufacturing standpoint, yeah. I still think that the investors, uh, you know, unless they're in very, very specific sectors, if people are looking at large tracts of land, 
if people are looking at some labor issues and you know, how they resolve that, if someone wants to export you know, a couple of billion dollars from India to three billion dollars, mm. the red carpet and the path for that is still not clear. So how the central government and state government work mm. together to make that happen? Mm. I think that will be very, very important. Because so you're, you're saying there's still a question mark there? It's not a question mark. I would say there is, there is still ambiguity to say, okay, how do we do it? Suppose I want to manufacture something, textiles or toys or some, you know, more labor intensive industries. And I really want to hire 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 mm. people. Are there enough examples for me to say, okay, or someone can help me guide through the whole process and say, how do I get 100 acres of land? Can I create a building uh, right. structure around me so that people can work? What are the labor laws? Will people work two shifts, three shifts? Can I get? So those kind of really details. And that's where I think if we can work and create some templates of that, then that would be very, that, that would be very useful. And Zareen, I want you to comment on this because this really is being positioned as the big opportunity, as our big moment, as global supply chains diversify, uh, and India emerges as a credible alternative, especially from a manufacturing perspective. To Raji Memani's point, are the pieces that we need to put in place, the building blocks that we need to put in place there yet? Are we closer to an inflection point today to your mind? I would say we are closer to an inflection point. Uh, maybe if I look at three, four years back compared to that, I mean, when I went to US on my road shows, almost every MNC was very interested in India. Um, to that extent, I would say we are really at an inflection point. Having said that, uh, we shouldn't underestimate our uh, other countries who are really also wooing a lot of the FDI, uh, like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, which are also becoming, and the whole ASEAN bloc is becoming quite a big beneficiary of the China plus one. Having said that, I think our PLI scheme has been really, really, and the low corporate tax rate has been really attracting uh, foreign direct investment uh, in a meaningful way. Hmm. Yeah, uh, well, you know, so that I think is the unaddressed part of the of the challenge and the opportunity. So the challenge presents itself as an opportunity as well. Other, let me come to you now because uh, you know the uh, the expectation is that we will continue to move higher when it comes to uh, the pharmaceutical as well as the vaccine manufacturing story. We have, of course, positioned ourselves as the global hub of the world. But how much are of the quality concerns, and there have been many in the last few months, how much of that has cast uh, a shadow on the industry at this point in time, as well as the way that the industry is being viewed globally? No, so um, there are these a few isolated incidences, which, um, of course, the regulator and others will take care of. Um, you know, wherever you look at anything that's gone wrong in any industry, despite having the best regulation, highest level of uh, regulation, you always have a few players who may not comply or may have some issues and even that is yet to be investigated. I don't think there's a final conclusion on whomsoever, you know, had quality issues, was it product related or not. So I won't comment on that. But, um, you know, largely speaking, India's image, especially with the COVID crisis and before that even, as the pharmacy of the world is very, very strong, you know, whether it's at Davos or any of these, of these global events, you see the interest that, that we have. But I'll tell you one or two things that we need to do to continue that momentum, and it's very critical, especially now that China, Korea, and the African continent are also investing and having a lot of capital flow there mm. to, to, to make pharmaceuticals and vaccines. We need to press on with the reforms that we have suggested to the government. Government's been very proactive. Um, we've already made a lot of changes like, you know, the stockpile permission so you don't lose nine months right. between, you know, clinical trials and research and then building up the vaccine stock or pharmaceutical stock reforms and also building our supply chain in India. You know, especially the pharmaceutical industry mm. has been dependent on uh, APIs and imports from China. You're seeing a lot of investment now being made in India by domestic players to be totally self-reliant. And I think that's really going to change the whole way in which things happen. Of course, prices may go up a little bit as a result, but that's initial. And then, you know, competition will take care of that. So I think these two things are very important for us to continue. And, you know, to answer your point, um, I don't think anything's going to affect the India image 
um, you know, one or two of these incidences which then get blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kotick, you know, since we are talking about the roadmap from resilience to resurgence, I want to understand from you, we've already discussed in detail, great detail, the announcements that have come in from the budget and the potential uh, impact of those announcements. But if there's anything on the unaddressed reform agenda side, uh, especially from a financial sector perspective, uh, you know, what would you like to prioritize at this point in time to really have that multiplier impact? And it could be outside of the financial sector as well. So first on the financial sector, if you look at the budget speech, the finance minister has talked about a need for review of financial sector regulation as in the budget speech and has said the time has come for us to be looking at the entire financial sector regulation and review the, the impact and uh, reassess the need for some of that regulation. So this is in the budget piece. So I think this is clearly on the agenda of the government and I'm sure they must be talking with regulators to put a process in place to get feedback and make uh, appropriate changes in the financial sector regulation. I think that's extremely important that in the year when India is at G20, mm. India benchmarks its own regulatory framework to the best in class. And we have to evaluate where we stand in the G20 in terms of our regulation in any sector, mm. including the financial sector. So where do we stand? I think that is an assessment which must be done and I'm sure that is, on the, that is maybe the driver for this particular point which the finance minister has put in her budget speech and it's a, something which will be hopefully acted on in the current year and revisit regulation. So what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, and she has said across all regulators, all financial sector yeah. regulators. So I think that's a very big change and an open mind which the government has demonstrated in this year's budget. But in your assessment, uh, specifically from a financial sector point of view, uh, from a regulatory perspective, what do you believe requires change? I think it's a long list of things which we need to Give discuss. Me the top and three. I, I think Give me it, the top three. I think the top three clearly is how is it that India is going to build capacity for the size of its ambition as a significantly larger economy. So I think that would be item number one, two, three. Therefore, every action we take must be consistent with building India at scale and the financial sector should be able to meet and address the requirements of India across the board. Dadinathan, let me get you to comment on that as well. Financial sector and outside of that as well. Uh, on this point that Uday just made, uh, what is the capacity India is creating? Let me talk about it from a retail point of view, uh, because it's a very important part of the, of the story. Uh, so today's uh, India's uh, retail book is about uh, retail. Personal credit alone is close to about $600 billion. Uh, uh, that's about uh, 50 lakh crores uh, on an economy, or let's call it 300 lakh crores, which is about, say, 16-17%. Now, as in India moves toward the U.S. kind of numbers, say 92 percent. U.S., by the way, is a 19.6 trillion dollar consumer credit on a 22 trillion dollar economy. That's like 95 percent. So as we migrate this path, one thing India has got right early on in the game, early, while still very small on consumer credit, is that our ecosystem of credit bureau, which is a very good guardrail, the cash flow lending, the UPI-based collection, mm. India has developed that and, and credit assessment through, uh, through digital channels. So India has got those guardrails right before we started a credit journey, which should give a lot of comfort to all of us that we're not, you know, hopefully not going to have a huge credit cycle on. We've addressed the issue of credit, we've addressed the issue of consumption, let me address the issue of capex. And I want to understand from each one of you what kind of appetite you have at this point in time to go out there and actually do big ticket capex. Anish, I'll start with you. Across each of your businesses at the Mahindra Group, how much risk are you willing to take? How, how uh, bold and courageous do you feel today? So, Shireen, uh, even as we look at a potential global recession, we are doubling capacity in our auto business today. We are halfway through that. In the next 12 months, we will be at double. We are increasing our farm capacity by 60%. In a holidays business, we are looking at putting up ideally another 25 to 50 resorts. Uh, our life spaces business is looking at uh, townships over large tracts of land. Logistics, we made a couple of acquisitions. We want to do more. So we are actually going out there uh, in a very bullish manner today and uh, looking for acquisitions, looking for more capacity, looking for growth to scale up our businesses. TV Narendran, do you, do you have the appetite for more? Are you still digesting what you already got? No, I think, Shireen, even in a challenging year like we've had, 
you look at it, we've spent more than 20,000 crores in India, 12,000 crores on inorganic growth and 8,000, 9,000 on organic growth. I think there are two parts to it. One is private sector capex will come back as demand grows, profitability grows, and balance sheets gets repaired. But I also think there's a lot more we can do to get more out of the capital which is already invested. Mm. And I think that's been an experience over the last few years. Whether it's private sector capital through the IBC process, you pick it up and unlock more value from it, or public sector capex like more recently we acquired Nilachal, a plant which was shut for three years is now running at full capacity. So I think there's a lot of capital already invested through the government or through private sector, which can also be far more productive, in addition to new capital going in. Prabha? I think uh, what's happened over COVID is certainly our supply chains have got more agile, more resilient, and more frugal. Uh, but I do think that CapEx and investment will come as the demand picks up. It will certainly keep pace with it, because the longer-term India story is absolutely in place. So. Are there? No, so I mean, uh, we've made investments and acquisitions both at our new campuses and also backward integrating by acquiring, you know, the raw material suppliers, syringe manufacturers and things like that, because I think that's very, very critical going forward, because we've been looking at, you know, the way in which all countries are th going through this self-reliance investment cycle, mm. which is what's closing the kind of doors to the kind of free flow of raw materials and materials without duties and other taxes that was happening. So. We've earmarked about $2 billion, of which we've spent already a billion and a half in CapEx. And also, we've earmarked another half a billion to acquire a few more of these sort of um, companies outside to support the raw material side. So, you know, I mean, the CapEx for all these new vaccines and things anyway um, is something which we're doubling down on. And we had already invested about one and a half billion during the COVID crisis, mm. obviously, for that capacity. So we're taking our capacity now to four billion doses. Um, which makes it, you know, uh, very, very... And international acquisitions to in ensure safety of your supply chain, that's yes. the focus. Well, that, and we've made some in India as well, um, you know, uh, with some partners from Germany, so we're doing that now. Zareen, what's the sense that you're getting in terms of uh, uh, lift-off as far as private capex is concerned when you talk to people? So, uh, it's, I think, very industry and sector-specific that we're seeing. Wherever we're seeing capacity utilization becoming higher, we're seeing definitely CAPEX happening. A core sector, real estate, uh, clearly data centers, lots of industries where we're seeing a lot of uh, greenfield investments or brownfield happening. I, uh, there are some industries where clearly capacity utilization is less than 75%. Where I think the moment it crosses that level, we see CAPEX coming in. Yeah, uh, yes, utilization varies across different sectors. Mr. Kotak, how much appetite do you have at this point in time to go out there and do uh, big ticket or small ticket acquisitions? We, we are very open and always uh, looking out for the right opportunity. And Shireen, back to the earlier point you yeah. made, which is about how do we build uh, scale and investment in India. What I feel is happening is, there's a lot of activity at the startup level, at the really small early stage, and there is pretty good investment by the big guys. I think what India has to focus is the middle. The middle corporates who have to be a core part of the building of India. And it is there I think we really need to focus. India must fix the missing middle mm for scale on a sustainable basis. Mm. But, you know, what do you believe is the need of the hour at this point in time in being able to fix that missing middle? Because this is not something that's new, that's on the table as a challenge or as a problem. I think to a certain extent, consolidation amongst the bigger players has happened significantly. And let's look at two or three sectors. Telecom. You're down to maybe two or three players. Now three. You look at airlines, you are effectively down to two players. Yeah. You look at steel, two big guys are really running away. Hmm. Where is the larger middle India to go out there and compete, becoming middle from small and middle becoming large so that many flowers can bloom? Hmm. So we have startups, we have the big guys. We've got to create the middle 
for building a sustainable and a resilient India as you started. You know, that's an important point that you make, Mr. Kotak. And let me get uh, TV Narendran to comment on this. You know, to his point that we've now got these monopolies being created across different sectors. We've got, we've got, <laughs> you're smiling. I wouldn't use that word. <laughs> okay, okay. We wouldn't be making do, losses do, if there was. Do, do, dominance, dominance. Uh, uh, but to his point on how do we encourage the missing middle to flourish as well? No, I think that's important, but we also need to look at uh, industries which uh, have to compete globally, need global scale. There's a Chinese steel company which produces more steel than all of India put together. Right? Bow steel is bigger than the steel industry of India. Mm. So if you have to compete with global players, you need scale. So you need the big guys to also scale up because India should be competitive, Indian industry should be competitive. But I agree with uh, Uday because there are also, there's also a very big role for the smaller players. I mean, there's no big manufacturing economy on the world which doesn't have a strong MSME sector. Mm. They are world-class MSME companies. They may not be big in size, but they're world-class in quality. I think Germany is a great example. Korea is a great example. Italy is a great example. So I think we need to, I agree with Uday that we need to build that capability. Uh, the big companies also need to play a role there mm. because a lot of them are part of the supply chain of the big companies. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. Rajiv Amani, to the point, and you know, this is going to be critical as we get to that 20 trillion or 26 trillion by 2030 target that, uh, that you put out. 2047, sorry. 2047 target that you put out. Uh, re react and respond to what we're no, hearing. No, I think it's absolutely right. But I would say that today, if you're an MSME, uh, you know, global volatility has gone up. Uh, you know, if he has to go and take loans, uh, you know, uh, None of these gentlemen who are here are going to give loans unless you have personal guarantees. So a lot of people are very hesitant to give personal guarantees. For them to approach and raise equity from capital markets, mm. I think the level of compliance that mm. one has, the kind of processes that one has to go through is very difficult. Is private equity, why is startup doing well? Because there is global funding like mm. venture capital, mm. private equity, that's available. Mm. For the mid-sized sectors, yeah. it's not available. But having said that, I think what I'm seeing is that a lot of Indian manufacturing companies, the larger ones, when they look at their procurement list, they look at what are the items that they're importing. And more and more people now understand that the mood of the government is very clear, that they want to encourage more and more manufacturing. So at least what we are seeing, that even in the MSME space, hmm. companies are looking at trying to see uh, the, uh, you know, how can they domestically manufacture more and more, yeah. and that's where we are seeing MSME uh, investments uh, that are coming in. And there have been some announcements in the budget, including one which Corporate India hasn't taken very well to, which is to pay the dues to MSMEs no, legitimately, which they, no, they ought think, to. No, I think they've taken it well. I think there are some issues which I think are not that significant that, you know, if you make provisions at the end of the year, you know, how will you treat that and everything else. But I would say, I think most of Corporate India, I think the tone of Corporate India, I, at least in my view, has changed from where it was five, six years back to now. Most people have a much wider view apart from their own industry. They are trying to see what's good yeah. for the country and how they want to drive that piece. He's lobbed the ball back in your court, um, Mr. Kotak, in terms of coming out there and nurturing and supporting the thousand flowers to bloom. No, my, what are you doing about it? <laughs> my, my position is clear. As a banker, we would love to dramatically increasing increase financing of the middle okay because that's where we really see an opportunity um, and as long as we can manage our risks and the returns we think there's a huge opportunity uh, on the larger players as you asked me the question in the beginning they in any case going overseas they think Indian <laughs> banks are too small for them so where is the question do you see that changing do you see that changing though now Depends on them. Ask Narendra, <laughs> ask Anish, ask uh, other and other corporates you talk to. He's, he's lobbying. He's lobbying the co ball back in your court. Now, Anish, I'll get you to start responding to Mr. Kochak. Uh, so, on this, we borrow from Indian banks only. The service is great. The rates are actually lower than what we can get from outside, given the credit rating we have. Uh, the only thing is, we don't borrow too much, and we've been generating lots of cash, so we've been repaying whatever little we borrowed. Uh, so therefore, we don't count in the sort of list of borrowings as such. But on the middle, it's hmm. a very important point, and that's also up to the industries. Because if you look at the auto and tractor yeah. industries, we've developed a very large ecosystem, and many of them have become large corporates in their own right, not yeah. not just MSMEs, and they are supplying globally 
as well. So we've created a very strong ecosystem in the industries that we are in, and I think that will happen in many of our industries as we go forward. In commodities and services, yes, you may have larger players, you may have more consolidation, but as we start thinking of manufacturing in India, we will start generating a lot more MSMEs that will graduate beyond that. Get wrap up comments from each of you and Vedi Nathan, I'm going to start by asking you, you know, to respond to of course the points that were made here, but also the single biggest risk as well as the single biggest opportunity that you believe we ought to focus on. Uh, to uh, to Rajiv's earlier comment and single biggest opportunity according to me, uh, the in that context, uh, this uh, concept of cash flow financing has been repeated so many times that people are almost not taking it seriously, but it's an extremely important thing. So today you see a, an entrepreneur's bank statement, money in the bank, cash flow is not real cash, cash, cash is like what is money in the bank. So you're able to see the money in the bank, almost take an x-ray of it, process it and give a credit. Uh, uh, and you can give credit without assets, but it's as secure as taking assets as security. So my view, therefore, is that uh, the biggest gap that India had for 40, 50 years that entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs don't get credit because of the availability of digitization and cash flow evaluation is going to dramatically change, which is the reason you're seeing that the SME credit, which had the highest NP among state-owned banks historically, like 14%, 15%, now it's not even 2%, 3%. So that's a very big mm. uh, uh, op opportunity uh, I see for, uh, for going ahead. I think this is massive for India. Large corporates anyway get a lot of credit, no issue there. It's the small and the medium, which I think is, is, like, a, is like a big deal. To give you one number, uh, the, the MSME credit in India right now is about like 15 lakh crores. Mm. Mm. Our own estimate is that 15 lakh crores will touch 30 lakh crores in a safe manner in the next four or five years. So almost double over the next four or five years. Yes. Prabha, the big risk that you're bracing yourself for and the big opportunity that you're working towards. Actually, Shireen, they're both identical because if we can get penetration and consumption in rural India, that's the biggest opportunity by far. And if it doesn't come, that is truly the biggest risk as well to our business. So it's probably two sides of the same coin. And I want to add one uh, wish list, so to say. I mean, I've never succeeded in this wish list, but I'll ask it again. In the sense that the uh, corporate tax rate today uh, for, for everybody is very fair. 25% is pretty attractive. But small entrepreneurs should not be at 25 uh, I have always been arguing that we need uh, a, a progressive tax code, even for corporates, so that small entrepreneurs start paying maybe 5 10% tax rate at that marginal. It will make a big difference to the cash flow, mm. will big difference to lenders' ability to lend anyway. It will change the game. Well, l l now this game-changing idea will probably have to be considered by the Finance Minister for Budget 2024. Big risk, big opportunity, TV Narendran. Opportunity for me is the digital infrastructure that India has built, and I think uh, that's bringing in more formalization of the economy, more access, etc. I think we can leverage that more and more. Uh, risk to me is a little bit more on what happens post-China. Will oil prices go up? Will our energy bill go up? Our current account deficit is not in a great shape. We like sports pick up because if the rest of the world is struggling. So I think we need to watch the current account deficit and oil prices. Rajiv Bimani. I think energy and geopolitics, I would say, are the two biggest risks. I think opportunity, and I'm sort of, sort of going back to in the industry that I belong to. I would say the speed at which digitization is happening in India and also globally, and India now becoming the central point of that, I think that's really becoming a massive, massive opportunity. I mean, if we were to just talk about ourselves, this year, we'll probably be hiring more than 40,000 people. And I think that we'll probably have more than that next year. So that opportunity... So 40,000, 2023, and double of that, no, or no, close, 40, or yeah, more than yeah, that, yeah, more than that next say, year. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, and that's really the way technology is transforming uh, at a massive space, uh, both here and more so, you know, what's happening outside India and the quality of work that's getting done in India. Sorry? I think um, on the risk, it's more uh, the global volatility. To my mind, it's the unknown for a lot of us. Uh, in terms of opportunity, I think it's more how do you leverage the digital infrastructure to do better uh, lending and um, reduce your cost to serve. To my mind, that's the opportunity. Anish? Uh, the risk is inflation, commodity prices, and oil. The opportunity for India and for us is manufacturing excellence. How can we create a manufacturing hub in India and supply the rest of the world?
Mr. Kotak, you, you know, you had warned, uh, warned us of uh, the risk of inflation, the wolf of inflation. Uh, I remember pre-COVID and, you know, you've been sort of reiterating that risk and we've seen what's happened since then. At this point in time, uh, as you look at your dashboard, what's flashing red? You know, I think uh, I, at, the good news is uh, I'm struggling between whether we are in a story of Goldilocks or Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella has a problem of midnight. Goldilocks is Goldilocks. So we are in a good place. But the, the question which always comes to me from a risk point of view in my mind is, I think about current account deficit of a country as a profit and loss account. And India has had that challenge of having a negative profit and loss account for as long as I can remember. For a true resilient India, we should reach a point where we are not dependent on external financing for meeting our imports. And that is something which is very critical. And if geopolitics and other challenges happen, a current account deficit means we need dollar checks to fill our hole. We have to correct that over a period of time. But it doesn't seem to be correcting itself over a long period of time. So that is one thing which always bothers me. On the positive side, I think the finance minister mentioned in our budget about how per capita income. You know, we like to talk about India becoming the fifth, fifth largest economy. That's great in the big picture, but we have a denominator challenge. We have 1.4 billion people. Therefore, when you divide it, our per capita, as she mentioned, is 197,000 rupees, which is two and a half thousand dollars. The opportunity for every one of us is how can we take this two and a half thousand dollars per capita and not absolute GDP? to $10,000 per capita. That is the single biggest opportunity for us to achieve in the next period as we look about it. Next period means what? That, I mean, it depends on what rate you compound. Hmm. That is it. And what rate you compound and to what extent your currency holds. If your currency keeps on also depreciating, per capita dollar 10,000 is a moving target. But we must work towards a goal of a per capita target in addition to absolute GDP target. So Rajiv, next time you have a 2047. <laughs> Our report was on per on capita. On per capita, I have Two, to say. $2,500 going to $15,000 in 25 years, and that's India's biggest opportunity. Even if it's 12,500, it's fine. I agree. That is India's biggest India opportunity. India has to not only move from the lower end of middle income, yeah. probably we are just below the lower end of middle income, to above the middle income, because we have to get beyond the middle income trap as well. And that is something which I think is one of the biggest opportunities for India and every Indian. I'm curious, why Cinderella? Cinderella, because you know, it's back to... Are we, no, because it's, it's a very specific, it's a short time window that Cinderella had to go out there you know, and, and, and sort of party, so to speak. So. so we are in good times. We just got to make sure it is Goldilocks and not Cinderella. Well, let India be Goldilocks and not Cinderella. That is the perfect note to end this conversation on. Many thanks to our jury members for joining us here this evening. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights. We will, of course, be back with the winners of the India Business Leader Awards in a short while from now. We keep the suspense going for a little bit longer. But from all of us here on the team, for now, goodbye and many thanks for watching.